Um, it is our pleasure to have guest speaker Tim Kelly join us today. Tim is one of New England's most experienced broadcast meteorologists and was on TV in New England from 1986 to 2021. That's a 35 year run, that's pretty spectacular. He grew up on Cape Cod and lived his entire life near the ocean and the mountains. He's passionate about weather and the outdoors in general and especially snowstorms. Welcome, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> jokes in my head that I'm not going to say right now because I haven't had a cocktail yet. But there's something about a big rubber ball that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Our favorite thing to do when we were little kids is just go out and make toys out of anything, right? Sticks and stones and water. And uh, that was so fun. Uh, we used to uh, take those ink berries, those poke berries, and we used to throw them at each other. <laughs> and now we're all addicted to our little devices. And of course, there's a big one there. Look at the size of this little device. <laughs> I put together a video that I'll show in a few minutes. The name of the show today is uh, Barbara and Jim Morrissey invite Tim Kelly to Cohasset. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, and Diane and everybody. And Anybody I, I have not met yet, I think that uh, it was Keats that said, there are no strangers, just friends we have yet to meet. And so that's what I called today's video. There's the title up there in the upper left. I just produced it. I mean, I woke up uh, this morning in a, uh, 200 miles away from here in a different climatic zone. I traveled through three climate zones to be here today. And I will talk about why this zone is the most interesting on Earth. I grew up in this climatic zone too, pretty much. Cape Cod, wearing the colors. Uh, that's where I grew up, Cape Cod. And uh, the formation of Cape Cod, though, is kind of different than Cohasset, but the proximity and the weather we have is very similar. Cape Cod did not exist for millions of years in, in, after Cohasset was established by God or whatever forces bring everything together. Cape Cod is merely 15,000 years old, where Blue Hill is hundreds of millions of years old, which is just fascinating to me. So anyhow, I'll get to that, but why don't I just see if everyone can stay awake for seven minutes and three seconds. This is the goal. This is the time. You try to fall asleep. I'll rattle, I'll ring a bell or something. So we only have to listen for seven minutes and three seconds. Go ahead, Richard. <laughs> segment I uh, do every day called Out the Door, Weather and More with T-Rex and TK. But we don't have a T-Rex right here. T-Rex for dog. We do have a gorgeous Mount Mansfield. Mount Mansfield. Where I woke up. Shaped like a man's head. And the head's over here. And then there's the nose. And then a mustache and a chin. Yeah, it's a slight exaggeration, but... Uh, there are six feet of I'll snow up there up on the ground in the chin, and you can right, actually yes, ski yes. those fields up there. So, making this video just for my friends in Cohasset, that I am on the road from Vermont to Cohasset to discuss why Cohasset and New England in general has the most interesting weather on Earth. Coming right at you. 7.09, about nine minutes behind schedule. <laughs> No, I don't think we'll be seeing the snow this deep again this season. But April 1996 it happened. But the next 10 days do not look too promising for snow accumulation. Heavy frost on the side of the road and in the fields. So pretty with a frost on everything. I just had to pull over Moscow Recreation Field here in Northern Vermont. Even the snow has frost on it. There's the West Branch River out there. So the river's going to be coming up. It's probably about 20 inches of snow in the snowpack way up high. I meant 20 inches of water. So it could get a little challenging in the river department also with this rain and warmer air this weekend. <clears throat> Not much ice on the rivers, though, so we don't have to worry about ice jams for the most part. 
Yeah, it gets windy around here, that's for sure. Honestly, I do not know why this is called Four Frost. It's just gorgeous. Very close up. Fence. The fence. Is that what you phoned him? Yeah. Moscow, Northfield, Vermont, still a lot of snow on the ground. But as I go down the Connecticut River Valley, it'll be gone. Really pretty ride this morning. This is classic. Way on the horizon, a view of Pico and Killington. An inversion this morning because it was colder in the valleys. So it's called stability in the morning when the cold air is down low and the warmer air is up high. Uh, with the heating of the sun as we go over the White River here. We go over the White River Junction, Vermont. The afternoon heating of the sun causes updrafts, warm air, gets less dense than cold, rises, cools, and condenses this rain in your afternoon clouds, and April showers can develop. Unless it's March. We call it March showers. Interesting that we have these huge ice waterfalls there on the northeast side of the rocks. They get sun in the morning, but not in the afternoon. And the rocks on the other side didn't have anything on them because they get the afternoon sun. Share in Vermont is still totally covered with snow. Last week, there was a two footer here. Quick stop in Sharon for some provisions and uh, maybe a, a better look at the White River. I'd love to stick around and watch the water rise over the next couple weeks. We might come back. Hopefully it doesn't get too bad. Oh, we want Steve wants to go out just as bad as T-Rex. So, Wait a minute, I'm bad. It's 41 degrees. It's kind of a chilly day, huh? <laughs> Always excited to run outside. Oh, look at this. It's boating season. <laughs> Who is that? Going towards Hull and Cohasset. That's what I'm doing today. Going to Cohasset. And this video is for the people I'm about to meet at the Cohasset Senior Center. Just got home. Uh, happy to see T-Rex. Look at the Forsythia is going to bloom this week. A uh, big curiosity of the day so far is why no instability clouds? I guess maybe partially because there was an inversion that really has not broke down yet. The wind is slightly from the northeast, and when that happens, we often get a sea breeze front, and that'll be an uh, instigator uh, to cause the air to converge near the ground and then rise along with the heating of the day. So uh, something is overwhelming the development of these afternoon cumulus. I would say it's probably stability, and uh, that would be cold air near the ground and not cold enough up in the sky. And also, it can happen because way up in the sky, if the jet stream is convergent, that is air blowing into itself, that causes the air to push down, and that would prevent the uh, normal afternoon cumulus. But they're going to really start building late in the day. There's a front on the way. There's an Arctic front tonight, and it should be a snow shower or snow squall, maybe all the way to Cohasset. We'll see about that. Uh, that is uh, George Lane Beach right there. This is Weymouth. This is the Four River, and I'm really blessed. Uh, to live right next to where Don Kent raised his family, and this was Roger's house. So once again, this is primarily for the good people here in Cohasset, and I'll do a more complete weather analysis and out the door weather more tomorrow. Looks like we have a big April Fool's prank coming in after a very cold Red Sox home opener on Saturday, April Fool's Day. We're going to have warm, windy conditions with a chance of thunderstorms, believe it or not. I think the Red Sox play Saturday, too. Oh boy, things have really butted out. Those are the pussy willows that started from a stick not too many years ago. I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. Yeah. And missed some rain. Wow, overachiever yesterday, huh? 0.78. Did anyone call for 0.78 inches of rain in the Boston area yesterday? I don't think I did. That was a few inches of snow on the mountain. Rex, no, please, come back. Rex, come. Come on. Good boy. Yeah, we'll go for a walk later. Very busy today. Come on, Rex. This way. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that, that was a couple of birds.
Good boy, Rex. Come on. Seven minutes and three seconds. Everyone's awake. Something today. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I was on TV for 35 years, and it became less fun as everybody got so serious and pushing and pulling and telling me what to do. I, I love not being told what to do. <laughs> so I'm pretty much back to that. Just like when I was a little kid and weather was my hobby and I just, I kept a weather diary and I talked about it to anybody who would listen and I listened to everybody too, like Don Kent. Um, I'm friends with all the uh, weathermen that you remember growing up with. We all became friends. I'm still in communication with Bob Copeland and uh, he's helping me start another business which is called Forensic Meteorology, which is kind of serious because you work for lawyers. And when someone slips and falls, they need a forensic weather analysis of the conditions. And it's a very high paying job. It's enjoyable for me to do the analysis, but it's challenging emotionally because someone's getting hurt and someone's getting sued and someone might not ever be as healthy as they were and the person that's being sued may lose their livelihood. So that's just something I'm coming to grips with right now. That uh, weather analysis, uh, that's going backwards, right? Look back at the weather. Uh, I, I mostly enjoy looking at the present weather and trying to get the next six hours right. So I don't know if you noticed, but I made a mistake already this morning. I said that the midday heating of the sun would cause cumulus clouds to develop. It's and I'm still not sure what I did wrong. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to look at a forensic analysis. Uh, everything works in waves. And to make clouds, air has to go up. And that causes cooling, condensation, clouds, and if there's enough forcing, rain or snow and thunder and lightning. And then when air sinks, so the air can't go up everywhere all the time, it has to sink somewhere else. And when the air sinks, it warms and dries and makes blue sky. Now, today, with the very cold air mass this morning, I would have thought that the heating of the sun would have got us to what's called the critical temperature uh, to to, for uh, moisture to reach the condensa lifted condensation level, L lifted? LCL. That's something we had to really study. Uh, in college. Where is the lifted condensation level today? And then how much more does it have to lift to become saturated and overcome, uh, to get water droplets big enough to overcome the force of, gra uh, of the light, the, the air rising, eventually the, the, precipitate, the cloud <clears throat> particles and precipitation is going to get heavy enough that it's going to fall. And so the air goes up, it forms the raindrops, the snowflakes, then it comes down. Now, what a hailstorm, hailstone is, you get hail with 80 degrees in the summertime, right? So that's when the air goes up violently because there's a, say, a front coming in with cold air running into warm air and collision of air masses causes the air to rise. And, and you saw the terrible videos coming out last week from those tornadoes and hailstorms. So what happens there is the updraft is so strong that the wind blowing up can actually take the raindrop up above the freezing level, which might be around, I don't know, 13, 15, 17,000 feet in the summertime. And, and the wind is still blowing that raindrop up, and then it goes to the freezing level, so now it starts freezing, and it's still going up, and it's accumulating other drops of water, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually that hailstone can be this big all of them together, and all of a sudden they all turn around and come down at the same time. And that's called a microburst, or it even turns into a tornado. So you can just imagine the air going up. And so if it's going up, there's going to be a bit of a rotation in the cloud where it's going up the fastest. It's going to cause these vortices, right? So you can get a vortice that kind of tips over, and that's what a tornado is pretty much. Uh, the, the updraft, just, it's still kind of a mystery, the exact formation of a tornado, the exact formation of a hurricane. 
Uh, there's still a lot of things that, you know, we're getting better and better and better, but we still can't tell you that there's going to be a tornado in Cohasset at 7.30 tomorrow evening. I mean, it's just impossible. All you can do is say that there's a 10 to 15% risk that one of these thunderstorms, if you get it, could have a tornado. So there's two coulds there. You could get a thunderstorm, and then uh, say the probability is 50%, and then within that, you could even get a tornado, and the probability in that is like 2%, really. Very small probabilities. And so there's still a lot of cutting edge meteorology that, that, that people are still trying to understand and learn. And so it never gets old. It, it's always doing something. And you know, it's killing me right now to have these shades all down. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was in school, I would, the teacher would be talking and I'd be just like, cloud, bird, cloud, bird, stick, <laughs> snowflake. <laughs> yeah, I drove my parents nutty. I, I was afraid of thunderstorms, really badly afraid of thunderstorms when I was two or whatever, one. Uh, things coming out of the sky. The moon was so big, you know what I mean? Where the moon rises over the horizon. Uh, doesn't it look like it's this big when the moon first comes up over the trees or the hill? <laughs> Here's a fun game. Uh, almost a bar game. So when, how big is the moon actually? How, if you held out a basketball, a bowling ball, a tennis ball, a golf ball, or a pea, which one of those items would be the same diameter as the moon? If you want to take a guess at that? The pea. The pea. The pea. All right, exactly. You can use your pinky finger. Your pinky finger will cover the moon held out like this even though it looks like this on the horizon. And then when it gets to the top of the sky, how big is it then? Exact same size. It's an optical illusion. I asked my college professors to explain it to me. Well, Timothy, <laughs> we know that the moon is very large, right? And we know the Earth is very large, right? So when the moon is adjacent to the Earth, two very large objects. But we know that the universe is immense. So when the moon is alone in the universe, it looks so small. Yes, Dr. Berryman. Okay, that's what I'll tell everybody for the rest of my life, even though I really still don't get it. <laughs> and then as Lieutenant Warp of Star Trek Next Generation said, there are some things that cannot be explained, <laughs> yet they exist nonetheless. <laughs> so why does Cohasset have the most interesting weather on Earth? The short answer is, that's our position on the face of the Earth. We are roughly halfway between the equator and the North Pole. So the equator is very warm, it's very humid, the North Pole is very cold, it's very dry. And we are also on the edge of a massive continent, North America, which includes Canada, the United States, and Mexico, which is cold, temperate, and hot. Okay? And we live on the edge of a vast ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, which has the Labrador current coming down to the Gulf of Maine, which is very cold. And we have the Gulf Stream, which actually comes out of the Gulf and goes all the way to Ireland. So we have all these different sources of cold, dry, cold, moist, hot, humid, hurricanes from Africa, storms from Hawaii, and storms from Greenland, and storms from the Bahamas, all coming at us all the time. So whenever you watch, uh, the weather map of a big nor'easter. I'm sure I got one in there somewhere. These are all my videos. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything to draw with. <laughs> so, I'm just going to pretend. So, here's the United States. This is California. Here's Massachusetts. And say you've got the air coming down out of Canada here, and then you've got the air coming out of Florida here, and they meet just south of Cape Cod at 40 degrees north, 70 degrees west. west. We call that the benchmark, because that's where the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream come together, and the upper level cold comes out of Canada, the upper level warmth comes up from Florida, and it spins, and that's what a nor'easter is. We had two of them this month. Uh, the first one was on a Saturday, the second one we blew, I said it was gonna snow seven inches here, and how much did you get again? <laughs> oh yeah, zero. So I only missed that one by seven inches. <laughs> problem with that storm, you want to get an hour? <laughs> that storm had two centers. 
One center was over Connecticut, and another center was over Nantucket. And the center over Connecticut had so much force that it kept the warmer air coming out. See, uh, air circulates around a low like this. So you need the low to go south of Nantucket to keep the air coming from the northeast. So that Connecticut low, by staying stronger, kept the air coming from the southwest too long. When it finally did get off of Cape Cod, it did snow much of that afternoon. It just didn't accumulate. It wasn't warm enough. But the, you know what? The top of Blue Hill got 7.2 inches of snow that day. <laughs> they, we missed it by 635 feet. The top of Blue Hill is 635 feet. So there was a three foot snowstorm 1,000 feet over our head that day. And all the hills out in Worcester County. You drive down to the Connecticut River Valley, there was about 12, and then you went up to Chester and Beckett. 30 inches, trees down all over the place, tremendous damage from that storm. And so there was concern, and this is the really hardest part of being a weatherman around here, those rain snow lines. So I don't miss making those maps at all. When I go out the door weather and more, you're not paying, you can change the channel, and whatever, uh, you don't need cables, well you need the internet, don't need to watch this stuff. Or I can just come over to your house every morning. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't really try and nail like, okay, uh, Cohasset's getting one inch, Hingham's getting two inches, Weymouth's getting three inches. I just say, you know, it's supposed to snow, I think that you're going to get six to eight inches or whatever. But I do a very precise forecast for JP Vermont. And uh, that storm, the government and the other meteorologists were only calling for five to ten inches of snow. Not even that, six inches of snow at JP. And I said, well, from what I can tell, it looks more like two feet. And so the forecast for northern Vermont was for five inches of snow, and JP got 29 inches Ooh, of yeah. snow. Now, I went for 24, which was still three times more than anyone else. And uh, so I just got back from JP where I was treated like really well. <laughs> I got a hotel room, I got ski tickets, <laughs> people were buying me beers. I got up on the uh, first tram in the morning and I, I skied some places that are very rare. Um, I got to do what's called a face shoot, which is the, the snow that fell all day Sunday. Oh, that's another thing. So that storm was last Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. And it rained on Thursday and Friday and all that powder turned into ice and everything on Saturday. But I had forecasted another system that would deliver eight inches of snow, Saturday night and Sunday, and they got exactly eight. And I was there. I didn't say six to eight. I didn't say. One of the things about forecasting on TV that I learned a long time ago is that if you forecast a storm, you say six to 12 inches, and you get seven, everyone's going to come up and say, you said we were going to get 12. <laughs> so I, I stopped doing that. If I thought it was a six to 12 snowstorm, I would say eight or nine. I would pick a number, you know, leaning towards nine on this. Somebody's gonna get a foot, but I wouldn't write it down. I would just show the nine, and I would state that someone's gonna get a foot. And it would be generally about eight or nine, and that would be cool. Uh, so we've become very spoiled. Maybe you guys have it, but the, especially younger people that with the, the, the apps and the iPhones and everything. In the old days, if we said it was gonna to snow tomorrow, and it snowed tomorrow, we were happy. And now you want snow, what time is it gonna start at my house? And uh, I need to know when it's gonna end, and I need to know exactly how much we're gonna get. All right, Barbara, it's going to snow at your house tomorrow from 3.40 p.m. till 7.18 p.m. and you're going to get precisely 2.4 inches of snow. There. <laughs> and then you can go, he's so full of it, which is true. But that's what people expect now, to, to get the minute of the precipitation right. And what time is the thunderstorm? I get plans tomorrow afternoon. Can I go between 1 and 3? Oh yes, uh, the thunderstorm will wait till 3.04. That's, that's what you're to do. <laughs> Uh, and it, that's how it's going to be on Saturday. I think, you know, the Red Sox are playing tomorrow, then they have Friday off. And the Red Sox are playing, I think, Saturday. I think it's an afternoon game. And now with these forecasts, uh, people are canceling things like two or three days out. I'm going to forget the Halloween about four or five years ago, four years ago. I had a problem with my team at work. Like Pete Bouchard was forecasting like heavy rain or even snow on this Halloween night. And uh, so all these towns canceled Halloween. That's a new thing. Yeah. Uh, we didn't cancel any Halloween in the old days. We didn't ask the government, can we go trick or treating? 
mean, hopefully our parents let us go, but this whole thing where we defer all these powers to people and hope for other people to make our decisions for us, that's one of the things I see in the news now. That's one of the reasons I like not to be there anymore. But anyhow, they all postponed their Halloween and moved it to a couple days later, and I was out in Halloween, and there was the moon. <laughs> and the moon was bright, and the streets were empty. And I was like, eh, uh, 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 uh. I just because I always say don't cancel weather based on a forecast. Usually, what we want to do is we want to see the people that whatever we've got planned, a wedding, whatever. You won't cancel a wedding, hopefully, but um, you know, a picnic or a weekend away. And uh, often, the, the the forecast is less bad. The, the weather that actually happens is less bad than, than what you know. It seems like a big hypothon now. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I guess I, you know, I'm guilty in a way of that, but I try to be a light, more light-hearted forecaster and not be alarming. And I think that's one of the reasons that I don't have to work there today. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just a little too laid back. You know what I mean? I wasn't scared to death of COVID. I'm not scared to death of climate change. and. Uh, I try and respect people's wishes and everything, but I don't want to stir it up. And uh, it's a thin line. It's hard, and it gets harder every single day. <coughs> like people get mad at me because I'm not afraid of climate change. I grew up on Cape Cod, and in fifth grade, first of all, I was petrified of thunderstorms. Right? I was afraid of the moon. <laughs> And when you're afraid of something, the only best way to overcome the fear is to learn about it, right? So I started studying. I was watching Don Ken. I was watching Bruce Schwegler and Harvey Leonard, Dick Albert, and everybody, Bob Copeland, and John Giorsi. I worked, I worked with John Giorsi on Channel 6 a million years ago. I was on Dialing for Dollars with George Kennedy. <laughs> that was so cool. I was like 22 years old. My parents got to see me on TV. And, uh, so I'm overcoming the fears, and then in fifth grade, the powers that be at the schools thought, why don't we send the fifth graders to the National Seashore for an extended field trip, like four nights. So we went on a Monday on the buses to the old Coast Guard barracks in Wealthy <coughs> on Coast Guard Beach, and we slept in the barracks. And every day we went in the vans and buses to, um, there used to be those radars up in Truro, those big golf ball things, I'll never forget, they look like golf balls, but you go inside and up, and those huge radars inside, they're all gone now. But that was fascinating to me. And Marconi, learned about Marconi and the wireless transmissions, and went to Marconi Beach, and the formation of Cape Cod, the geological, formation of Cape Cod from a ice mass, the Laurentian ice mass that came down and covered all the way to New York City for thousands of years. I don't know how long it was here. I think it was at least 100,000 years. And so we had a half mile to a mile of ice here, about maybe up to the top of Blue Hill, or even bigger than Blue Hill. Blue Hill would be a lot taller if it weren't for that ice mass. And a lot of the big boulders you'll see um, are called erratics. And those boulders came down from New Hampshire and Canada, pushed by the bulldozer of ice. And the terminal moraine of the ice mass is where Long Island and Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are. And the ice mass started pulling out about 20,000 years ago, and then it kind of pushed back a bit. And then it pulled out for good about 13,000 years ago. So about 12,000 years ago, Cape Cod was just a series of sand piles. And the oceans kind of joined them together to form that beautiful cape, you know what I mean? There's so many capes in the world where the water forms these, the, everything is in waves. So I was in awe. Every science project I did in like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade was about the formation of Cape Cod. <laughs> I was in awe of extreme climate change. Cape Cod is less than 12,000 years old. And Blue Hill is a couple hundred million years old. 
So to me, climate and weather has always been extreme. And then I was invited to the White House in 1994, maybe, five, somewhere in there, six. Al Gore uh, was running for president, and he invited all the meteorologists from around the country that could come to come. So I'm standing next to Al Roker and Bruce Wegler in line to get in the White House. Now, I'm not an umbrella guy. I never tell people to carry an umbrella, but I had on nice clothes that day, and I carried an umbrella because I thought it was going to rain. Guess how many weathermen in that line pulled out an umbrella? Ah! The reason I don't tell people to carry an umbrella is because most of my people I work for, in my opinion, build houses and deliver mail and go fishing and put a roof on, and those people do not carry umbrellas. I'm not going to say, you might want to grab an umbrella for that walk from your car to your office, because I don't care. I deal. Uh, it's going to rain. So what I would say is, you know, it would be good if you could find indoor work tomorrow. <laughs> Might be a good day for paperwork, something like that. But anyhow, weather was fun until about that day, about maybe 11 o'clock, in the blue room of the White House. And Al Gore had a big easel, and he had all these graphs and charts. And he talked about the temperature of the earth over history, and look at it, and we're doomed, and... <laughs> so, I listened, and I watched, and I shook Al Gore's hand, I shook Bill Clinton's hand, I'm in line, they're pushing you along in line, you get to say hello, and they like push you. <laughs> and, uh, so I get to, to, I think, Clinton first, and I, I look him in the eye, hey, Tim Kelly from Cape Cod, Mass, because I knew he hung out in the barrier. He goes, right on. <laughs> and uh, so I, then they push you. And then I'm, I introduce myself to Al Gore. Hi, it's Tim Kelly from Cape Cod, Mass. He goes, thank you very much. <laughs> and he didn't, I, I know he didn't see me. I mean, he just had a gaze. Anyhow, I got to shake the hand of Al Gore. And I got my picture with him. And I came home, and I called Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I, I said, do you have a climate expert that I can talk to? I just met Al Gore yesterday. He says the climate's all messed up. And so they said, yeah, we've got a guy, uh, Richard Lindzen. Yeah. I actually brought him down here before to the Red Lion Inn for a group discussion about 12 years ago. Anybody had that discussion? Anyhow, Richard Lindzen said, look at the, Cape, look at the uh, Boston Globe. You see, back in the good old days, the Boston Globe had these charts of the yearly temperature. And every month they would do an analysis. And that was done by Robert Letzenheiser, who lived to be 103 years old. He was a state climatologist a million and a half years ago, but I was at his 102nd birthday. Anyhow, when Rod, they, they, they dismissed all that, that good climate data, that great climate data. Richard Lindzen said, do you see that, how the record high is here and the record low is here and this in the middle? This in the middle rarely occurs. Weather is a balance of extremes. So when you hear the normal high temperature for March 29th is 49 degrees, you know how many times that happens? Like zero. Uh, what happens is you're gonna have one March 29th, like today, it's like 42 here because we're next to the ocean, which makes it fascinating. And then on Saturday, we're gonna be 60. And so if you add those up and divide by two, there's your normal weather. So it's a balance of the waves of the extremes. And Richard Lindzen, said, the most interesting thing about the climate now is how quiet it is. The climate has been unusually stable since the retreat of that last ice mass. And so now I'm on TV giving Al Gore's information, giving Richard Lindzen's information. This is, how long ago is 1992? That's 30 years almost. So I've been really trying to understand the whole climate thing for 30 years. And before that, I just thought it was fun. And now it's not allowed to be fun anymore. <laughs> now it's very serious. So something that was very enjoyable to me for half of my life became a bullseye on my back because I'm not alarmed now. And I care. I was one of the first members of the Society for Environmental Journalists. I've been recycling my whole life. I turned down thermostats. I closed doors. I mean, I do all the things that I think is sensible. 
And the EPA, I think, did a wonderful job cleaning the air. And we cleaned Bar Boston Harbor. We cleaned the air in Denver. Denver used to be you know, unbreathable air by cleaning up the emissions. And the, the two cleanest things that come out of an emissions pipe are H2O and CO2. And if you put H2O and CO2 together and you add sunlight, you get light. So CO2 and H2O together make us in an optimum plan that we have here. And to call CO2 a pollutant to me is just befuddling because it's really clean and it makes the planet greener and it makes things grow better. I don't want to see forest fires and floods and disasters and if I thought there was a way I could stop them, I would do whatever I could to do that. That's my position on that. I'm still studying and I'm still listening to all, anybody that wants to discuss it. I have, I've, I've met so many leaders. William Gray, I don't know if anyone knows that name. William Gray, he used to work at the Colorado State and he put out the hurricane seasonal forecasts. He was the first one, did it 30 years ago. Joe DeLeo did put out winter forecasts. And I know all those guys. And those guys that could make a forecast for two months out or three months out, those were the heroes to me. I, I thought they were great. And so I'm still studying. I'm still trying to understand it. And I'm, I'm still going to try and be as calm as I can. To me, the scariest thing in the world is what happened about three hours ago when I was coming out of New Hampshire and I got into Massachusetts and there were no cars and there were a few cars and there were millions of cars. And then all of a sudden, it was all brake lights. Uh, there was a terrible uh, a dump truck, uh, a tire exploded and the whole front corner and all the metal and plastic went flying across four lanes of I-93. And so all of a sudden it went like this way and that way and this way. To me, the, that is the scariest thing in the world. Driving on 93 or 128 at 70 miles an hour where I used to pass everybody before COVID. I would put my cruise control in 72 and I would pass most people. Now I put my cruise control at about 75 and I feel like my life is in danger. I'm just watching the people come from behind, going by me 80 to 90 to 95 miles an hour. That's the scariest thing in my world. And then we got by that truck accident and then those did it again. Somebody getting off 495 to get on 93, smashed into the back of the guy in front of them. <laughs> and this was just within four miles. So I went from being nice and relaxed to getting here to so stressed. Driving, and I will never miss commuting to an office in New Massachusetts. Oh my gosh. So I'm trying just to, I'm not quite old enough to be fully retired. And so my YouTube channel, <laughs> see that 989 right there? If 11 of you <laughs> click that button right there that says subscribe, that number will change to 1,000. And I will be a YouTube partner. And then I come over here, and somewhere in there, there's something that says monetization. <laughs> How to monetize, make money, running out the door, whether or more, with T-Rex and TK every morning. He runs out the door like that every single day. This guy, he's building, that's his dog, Kalea. This is, you wouldn't believe where he is. He's in the woods of northern Vermont shaping surfboards. <laughs> That's Sean Becchioni. He's a professional surfer and snowboarder. He's sponsored, and he, I had to go down this long, muddy, rocky, snowy road to get to his place. He's also got a place in, uh, in uh, Wellfleet. And, uh, that sounds like my phone. But hopefully it's not. I got it in a trash can over there, along with those flowers I cut. Uh, yeah, monetization. My videos are really fun, but the, the, you can't be in a hurry <laughs> because I talk about weather for like five to ten minutes. Let's see. I've been trying to reel them back. Seven oh four, six twelve, ten forty eight. 
That is a girl on a wall in a bathroom in Vermont, the Matterhorn. These little kids crashed into each other getting off the ski lift the other day. 182 views, 265 views, 263 views, so 12 views. Um, so I've gotten to uh, the point where I get like maybe, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 views a, a week. And, and when I get to 1,000 people subscribing, I can monetize. I don't know, I'll probably make a dime a week or whatever. You gotta start somewhere. I always told the kids, or I always do, and I love to speak. I love to speak to eight-year-olds and eighty-year-olds, my two favorite groups, because they're the <laughs> smartest people on earth. Something happens between eight and eighty where you just <laughs> become a know-it-all. You lose trust in everybody, and you think you're smarter than everybody, and your imagination goes away. But for kids up to about fifth grade, uh, third grade, that's eight years old. I love their enthusiasm over everything. They think they can do anything. They respect adults, and they've got unlimited imagination and want to learn. Then if you go to a high school, oh, heaven forbid. <laughs> I, I, host, I teach a, a seminar every summer. I'm part of the Blue Hill Observatory, and I just started this program called Launch Your Weather Career. And so kids from all over the country come to Blue Hill for a week, and we, we I teach the basics of weather, which I haven't really done here. I kind of did a little bit, but I'll tell you that story in a second. Uh, I was at the Blue Hill, and usually when they come and they want to learn weather, that's another thing. So they will pay attention to you no matter how old they are. But this two busloads came to Blue Hill for a tour a couple, uh, five weeks ago. And we were all in the lodge at the Blue Hill ski area. And there was, I don't know, 50 kids in there? and every one of them was staring down. So I walked around and said, what are you looking at? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And I was making them tell me what they were looking at. Half of them were playing games. Some of them were looking at sports. Uh, I don't know all the things they do. But you talk to a teacher now, and they say, we've lost them. We've lost the kids. High school teachers, college professors, they're coming into ninth grade, they don't know how to write, they don't know math, and I can't get their attention. So that's kind of scary. That's another thing I think we've got to be more scared of than I think CO2, is the fact that we're, we're we, I mean, the, 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 the smartphones and everything are brilliant. It's so fun being able to do all this stuff. It's hard to shut it off. So to me, I think it's kind of like, I don't know, a drug or something. We're so, need stimulation, need stimulation, need stimulation, and wow. Boy, anyhow, so what is weather? <laughs> weather is the forces of Mother Nature trying to balance out the differential heating of the atmosphere around the planet Earth. The sunlight with a direct incidence at the equator and very slight incidence at the North Pole causes very hot air at the equator and very cold air at the North Pole. And the laws of physics, quite simple, warmer air rises, it's less dense, cold air sinks, it comes down. So colder air is coming down from the North Pole, hot air is going over the top of it to the North Pole, but it's not that simple because the Earth is spinning so fast. And that causes the air to spin on its journey. So you have cyclones and you have anti-cyclones. Cyclones, counterclockwise circulation, draw air into a low pressure system, that air rises and it's stormy. Anti-cyclone pushes the air out from its center, which causes the air to sink down to fill that spot, and that's where you get your sunshine. And then there's every kind of mixture in between. And that's why if you throw in a warm current and a cold current and a warm land and a cold land, you get every kind of weather. Weather in Cohasset comes from Africa, it comes from Mexico, it comes from Hawaii, it comes from Alaska, it comes from Greenland. I've yet to see a storm go from Ireland to here, but it's tried a couple times. They're having a, every time we get a really bad storm around here in New England, almost invariably there's an equally as bad storm somewhere near Japan and England. It's just amazing. I call it high amplitude flow. So high amplitude flow means that you're going to have the jet stream contorted. And this winter we've had a standing wave in the atmosphere, for the most part, a standing wave being air coming down from Alaska, 
into California with a feed from Hawaii into California and then up from Mexico and then over the Gulf of Mexico like this. So there's been a standing wave of Alaska, California, up to Cohasset. And we've been right on that line with a warm ridge in the southeastern United States and the just relentless snow. Richard, I gotta show you the snow in California. You've all seen it, right? Yeah. Uh, I saw it too. Can I show it to you? Yeah. Are you still awake, everybody? Uh, there's my pajamas. All right, see that guy? Does he look familiar? The one above snow, rain, and weather? Doesn't he look like somebody used to be on TV? That is Doug Kent. We are good friends, and he loves to come over and see where he grew up. All right, where are we? What's that? There it is. Ready? Here we go. The thing that's different oh, about a good vacation home, I'm not getting paid, you always have the whole place to yourself. Oh, just morning here at North Star. It's yes. just before 9 o'clock. This is the lip line. Saturday. This is a lip line. You don't see it. Oh, That's a lip line. Most people want to get in the lip line. You want to go skiing? Oh, oh. the little model. I had my ski gear on, but I changed my mind. That's a real lip line. Ready? Tunnel. Watch the children. Lay it up again. Come on, keep on the lay up. Got a place to go. Big swings, not go. Let's start California. One. Let's go check the other line. There's another one. Let's find out this snow pile. See if we can see the end. Excuse me. Anybody got a camera? No. Skiing is great though. But I think I can fly home to Vermont and get up to snow faster than I can get up at North Star. Gorgeous day. This is our last day. Not fun. Not fun. TSA exit. Shows they're coming for a ride. Most of the people still coming up to the mountain. So I'm going to Soda Springs, California. Yeah. 
And the chaos. Oh, yeah, there's a view. Here, here, 10,000 feet for this view. It'll be worth it. If it was easy, everybody would be here. Nobody Instead of just most of us are here. Give me a helicopter to get up to that mountain. Jim can't always remain in college. We can get anything you want, so next stop, land on track over there. Leave it on that scene. Stop. What's it doing? It's trying to take us to somebody else's channel. Stop. <laughs> get out of here. Iron your clothes on five years. Listen, there's a good chance somebody's trying to hack your website right now. You've got to be. This is available to everybody that's interested. It's on the National Center for Environmental Prediction site. This is the government product. We pay for it. And the time up there, one kilometer, atheostrophic, reflectivity, DBZ type, 1,500 millibar thickness. Oh, uh, I can't read the time. Tuesday. 328.9Z, so that would have been, uh, <clears throat> let's say, so I got to do all these calculations in my head. The way you use the time when you're a meteorologist is green, Greenwich Mean Time. It's time in Greenwich, England, which stays the same. <laughs> so I go, everything is Zulu here now. So if, uh, if it's uh, 12 Zulu, we're four hours apart, 12 minus 7, I mean uh, 12 minus 4 is 8. But then when it gets to like 20, you gotta go 20 minus four is 16, minus 12 is four o'clock. So I gotta do like these three calculations just to say what time the map is. <laughs> Anyhow, look at that rain snow line. <laughs> right over, like practically Cohasset. So this was the forecast from three days ago for yesterday. So you saw that rain gauge I had, the, the one before, 0.78. All the guidance was in the order of 0.3 or 0.4. So we got more than double the H2O. So if that was snow, if it was a different season, because the low went south of us, the 540 line is usually the snow line, but it was, it's almost April here. If that were snow, we would have ended up with eight, and you would have said, they said three. <laughs> that's, the weather. that's what the weather did to us yesterday. And then in the afternoon, now I have webcams all over the place, and uh, I got them on my house, and uh, I'll show you one of them. Uh, the uh, the sky cleared. Did you see the water yesterday? The blue sky and the clearing. I'm gonna take questions in like two seconds. I'm just gonna show off. Okay, so subscribe to my YouTube, right? And also tell your friends that Tim also sells webcams. And he has time lapse and everything. <laughs> I do time lapse webcams. <coughs> That's my Twitter. I don't care if you follow me there. Where's such the weather at US? Mm -hmm. I got my own website, which you guys are going to be on tomorrow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, no matter where I am on Earth, I keep a weather diary and I can see what's going on in my house. And I got a time lapse for yesterday. Uh, there it is. Oh, he's watching my little. So that's right now. That's a live stream from my backyard. And some of you may know that I craft my own flagpoles. So I built that flagpole out of a birch tree. So you can see the branches. And and then this is my pussy will that I planted from a stick. And right underneath here is a swimming pool with a Schlitz sign that Don Kent built for his family. <laughs> and Don and Roger Kent built the winch and railroad tracks. And they took their boats up and down from the Four River on railroad tracks. And they built their masts and stuff in the house I live in now in the cellar. So it's rich in history. And I got the, their initials painted on the cellar and everything. And you go down to the, uh, and look at, you see Boston there. I also put web cameras on top of the Prudential Tower, which is a complete waste of money. I spent so much on that, they don't work. Because <laughs> the radio interference up above the Prudential Tower, you're not even supposed to walk past this yellow line up there. But I, I did put web cameras on top of the Prudential Tower, and we do own thebostonwebcam.com, and I sell web cameras like this. I can do a time lapse and hang out. They're very reasonable. 
Thanks for the rest. All right, uh, any questions? Is everyone still awake? Most people are still awake. Yeah, I don't know. I'm supposed to talk for like an hour or 45 minutes. Yeah, what'd you have for lunch? <laughs> yes? I have a question, but, I, but from what you said, I think it may not uh, be um, the kind of thing that you're interested in, but are there any apps that you would recommend <laughs> if for somebody who doesn't have all the webcams and all the... Uh, I think the government National Weather Service, I love the National Weather no, Service. Is that a what, what do you want to know specifically? Wind... Um, uh, all right. I, the reason I call my website surfskiweather.us is because a friend of mine in Europe actually uh, built a website called weather.us and I thought we were going to team up. And I use this a lot. Uh, this is free. I mean, there'll be ads. Subscribe now, etc. So it's not the NOAA one. Uh, so weather.us, weather and then you can put in Cohasset. So there's Cohasset, there's the radar, and it's automatically going to give you all this stuff here. So there's your hour by hour for the rest of the day. Yeah. And then see on the left all these different things there? So it'll give you three to five days, and the wind and everything's right on here. I find it really helpful. So there's the next three to five days, hour by hour. There's the wind down here, so if you go to scroll over that, you'll see Thursday, March 30th. 1400, this is when the Red Sox are supposed to be playing. Yeah. Mean wind, 10 miles per hour, gusting to 39 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Temperature at Fenway Park. Well, if we consider Cohasset kind of very similar. For the Red Sox game tomorrow, 1400, 39 degrees for tomorrow's home opener. Now, you can also switch models. So there's the Euro, it's going to be a little different. Uh, the GFS, that's the American model you hear all about, that's a little different. And so they're both about 40 degrees. So usually in a 24 hour period, they're fairly agreeable. And then if you go to the 14 day forecast, there's your next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And the shaded area is the um, gout. So the more shaded it is, the more the gout is. So if we go out to like next Thursday, you can see the high of 55, but the range is gonna be between Oh, high temperatures next Thursday, 43 to 65, <laughs> with low temperatures of 33 to 50. Wow. But anyhow, look at this. Next Monday morning, how cold it is again. Next Monday morning, uh -oh. it's supposed to be about 32. Plan I plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting mine out. I plan to tease on February 14th to go from home. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I plan to. Didn't work. Didn't work. I said it March 14th. No. You did? You did? Yeah. Are they up? Uh, we, our high temperatures have been all over the place. So now what this thing is right here, there's your 10 day, and every one of those lines is a different computer model. So the, the thing I look for, which is really challenging, is right, right there. I'll hover over that. So that's April 5th. This is really fascinating, actually. Uh, so that's next Wednesday's forecast. When the lines are all far apart like that, you're going to see different forecasts on television, which is the funnest part. Uh, so the brown one there, that's the icon. I don't even know what model it is. 41 degrees. And then the purple one, that's the euro, says it's going to be 65. So the forecast for next Thursday is a mixture of sun clouds, chance of a shower or a flurry with a high temperature of 40 to 65. <laughs> so if you see the weatherman on TV showing you all the different computer models for your hurricane or your snowstorm, well, the American model has it going to Bermuda, and the European model has it coming right up here. So we're still going to have to give it some time. <laughs> Change the channel. Call me. That, that stuff is called guidance. Duh. Yeah. And this one says 65, and that one says 41. You're the meteorologist. Which one is right? Well, I don't know which one is right, but I have a hunch. So what I do is I look at the guidance every single day, and I look for consistency, I look for things that make sense. Does it make sense for this storm to go to Bermuda when there's uh, such warm air coming up from the Bahamas? No. So I would lean towards the warmer guidance. But truth is, you usually go right in the middle, and that green dot right there, that's the American model, the GFS, 49. So in this case, I would say next Thursday is going to be 49 degrees. Oh, Call me up and ask me that. 
tell me if I did right now. <laughs> and then there's so many variables here. So this is my favorite website. As for apps, uh, radar scope I like to use for the for the radar and for wind. I make my own wind forecast, so I don't really use them. So now we can go to precipitation, and you can see the, the similar thing there. All right, for next Thursday, <laughs> that's fascinating too. So you see that one computer model has a total 10 day forecast. This is GFS of 1.19 inches of rain here. And you can see where it steps up on each day, what days it might rain. And then there's one, you got one at the bottom there. What is that? D DVD, it's a zero. Zero to 1.3 inches of rain. Uh, and then here's the wind, uh, seeing wind gusts. So there's your gust. A lot of wind. All right, a lot of wind. That's uh, Saturday gusting to 47 miles an hour. Uh, but that's a warm storm. Uh, so we might have a thunderstorm that day. And then if you scroll down, you see all the dailies, uh, the day hour by hour. 40, uh, that's tomorrow. Friday starts off 29, but then the temperature doesn't go down at night, it starts to rain. And there's Saturday, 52 in the morning, 57 in the afternoon with those winds. So there could be a thunderstorm in there. And then Sunday, look at that, snowflake, 5 a.m. Sunday. 60 on Saturday afternoon, snowing at sunrise on Sunday. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is stuff you're gonna deal with, though. That's in Cleveland. <laughs> and then that, there's the GFS, very warm, 65 next Wednesday. All right, now I can, no, I'm sorry, this is the Euro, right? Euro. All right, Euro is 65 next Wednesday. Now we click on the GFS, this is the American model. And so this is what we spend a lot of time doing, looking at this stuff. And there are also maps. So this is just for one spot. Uh, so, so there is the Wednesday from the American model next Wednesday. It's sunny in the 40s compared to a wet in the 60s. But it is April, so you've got to lean toward showers. <laughs> Uh, so that is my favorite weather website, and you can go to the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And there's so many. Talk to your friends, sailor that sail like at the yacht club. There's so many wind apps that they use, and some of them are free. Some of them are not so good. So thank you. They call me. The sailors call me. I do. A, I do a forecast for that Hingham uh, Bay Wednesday yeah. sailing boat race oh, yeah. every Wednesday, Tuesday, and Wednesday mornings in the summertime. And uh, I'm no more right than anybody else, but they like it because I mention it. <laughs> it's online. So I hang around at the boat yards. <laughs> yeah? You talked about weather. What about climate? Climate? Yeah. Uh, climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get. Uh, climate and weather are extreme. So I don't believe there's any such thing as a peaceful weather pattern or a peaceful climate pattern. Somewhere on earth, somebody today is having weather they've never had in their life. Every day, somewhere on earth, once in a lifetime weather occurs. And it's happening in California right now. You wanna look at a webcam in California for fun? <laughs> I, I sit at my table, I spend so much time doing that. So you make fun of the kids. Climate. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I used to, it's my job. It's my job. I tell the kids that they can do anything they want and eventually they can make money at it. Mm. And hopefully I can make a little money doing this, but I really enjoy what I'm doing right this minute. And I feel blessed that I have the freedom and ability to do it. And I am getting a little, I'm passing the hat in a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> nothing's free anymore. You're in the wrong room. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, it's, it's... They talk about climate change a lot. Yes, I tried to address that a little bit earlier. Yeah. I said that the climate changes are extreme. The fact that Cape Cod, we had a mile of ice over us just 13,000 years ago, which really is a pinprick. Like, do you know how long ago the dinosaurs went extinct? Mm. 65 million. 55 million years. Okay, so here's the dinosaur that's going extinct. You know how old Cape Cod is? 13,000 years. If you were to try and show the difference, there's the dinosaurs disappearing due to extreme climate change. Here is Cape Cod forming due to extreme climate change. And as for the whole settled science, 
say climate, settled science, there's no such thing. Settled science, it's always a debate. When I was a boy and I was in school, they told us that the dinosaurs went extinct because uh, an asteroid hit the Earth and sent up a cloud. It caused cooling of the Earth and they all, they lost their food supply and they froze and they died. Guess what? It's all changed. They changed it. You know why the dinosaurs died now? Anybody? Is that what everyone learned? Well, look again. So, somebody took a, a bullet and fired it into the Earth. And they had a microscopic camera that detailed the exact instant that the bullet impacted the Earth and what happened with the particles of Earth and what the temperature did. They superheated in the immediate environment heat up thousands of degrees for a moment. And so now, the latest settled science on dinosaurs, and it might be so, is that the strike of the asteroid was so intense that it caused the entire atmosphere to heat up hundreds of degrees, like a pizza oven. And the whole atmosphere around the entire globe turned into a pizza oven, long enough to burn everything. Except for sharks, horseshoe crabs, bats. Why, why did those things not get fried? Caves and under the ocean. Doesn't that make sense? Roaches somehow? I don't know if they were under the refrigerator. <laughs> Something like that could happen again. Uh, the whole underbelly of Yellowstone Park in Montana and Wyoming furnace trying to blow. I mean, that whole Wyoming area, Washington and Oregon, Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens was nothing. I mean, there could be a colossal explosion of those volcanoes, which will negate anything that any human has ever done, the entire history of humans. So there's nothing that we in this room can do about climate change. We can adapt. We can stop putting our houses within 10 feet of the ocean, but we refuse, don't we? And then we expect somebody to insure it. I lived on Peggotty Beach for a while. In 1976, no I'm kidding. But in 1976, there were houses on both sides of Peggotty Beach Road, and now there's st still two there, and they're about that high, aren't they? You ever go for a walk underneath the houses on Peggotty Beach? You got more stable ocean uh, line here in Cohasset and Hull, the rocks. Uh, down there, um, oh, I can't remember the name, but it's erodible cliffs. So whenever you put in hard armament, I was on the Situate Coastal Committee and all that. I've, I've been studying this forever. I'm trying to be able to answer these questions as well as I can. But whenever you put hard armament, like that jetty, not the jetty, um, um, it's called a, a revetment. There's one at the Situate Lighthouse, and then there's one that connects Piggity Beach all the way to just about uh, the North River, just about. And so what that does, it causes you to lose your beach because the beach is replenished by erosion processes. So whenever you put a hard armament against the cliff, you're gonna lose that natural replenishment of your beach and you're gonna lose your beach. You can see the high tide at Nantasket Beach. Most of the wall, is, you can't, there's no sand there. Right. And they've done it on the north side of Dennis, which I, I'm from Dennis and I saw it. And I'm like, who did that? And what happened to the beach? If you go to the National Seashore, please do, and you go to the cliff, you look down, it looks the same as it did when you were five years old. It looks the same, however, it's about a quarter of a mile west of where it was when you were 10 years old. So barrier beaches are transient. So when we build these houses, on the water, all those homes in situate on the water are all vulnerable. And so we worked hard to try and help the homeowners. So we got all the permission for Hull, uh, not Hull, Hummer Rock. All the permission, all the money, all the engineering studies, all done on how to help the residents of Hummer Rock. The only thing we needed, and I say we because I was part of that team once, was access through a few people's property to bring the heavy equipment 
around to do the job. And the project never got off the ground because the homeowners would not grant access for the heavy equipment to save their house. Because there's wording in the permission slips that scares people. And it makes people that own those places think that other people, heaven forbid, might be able to walk next to their house to go to the ocean. I don't believe anyone is allowed to own the ocean. <laughs> I you can come down those stairs T-Rex was on just a short time ago. Come on over. Go down those stairs. I'll, I'll show you the way. And in Weymouth, we've got another project. They're trying to put a, a revetment uh, between George Lane Beast and Wetsuit Gusset and fix it up. And a lot of my neighbors are not too happy about it because they'll leave people. People walk down there anyway. Anyhow. How do I get on that subject? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, the, 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 the climate and the change, ocean levels. Guess how much the ocean has come up in the last 12,000 years since Cape Cod was formed? They're all worried about 10 feet, 20 feet, or whatever in the next 100 years. Anybody want to? I'll, I'll give you choices. All right, ocean levels since Cape Cod was formed in 12,000 years with that last ice mass that retreated. Has it come up? One of these? Two of these, ten of these, up to the ceiling, or three quarters of the way up Blue Hill. The ocean level has come up over 400 feet in the last 12,000 years, and we're going to stop it now. We don't like it anymore. I live in vulnerable spots. I live on Bass River. I'm trying to. Save Bass River. Uh, one of the things I'm doing is I'm measuring the water quality in Bass River weekly now, <clears throat> in the summer, for oxygen, for nitrogen, for turbidity, um, temperature, and we're trying to restore Bass River to the status it had in the 1800s, the number one uh, herring run. Still, I think is probably is Wayne, the Four River, uh, not the Four River. They went up to uh, Whitman's Pond. And the number two was Bass River. I never knew that. That Harry used to go all the way up Bass River until the Thatcher family, who owned much of the inland area in Yarmouth Port, dammed it all up and built cranberry bogs. So they stopped the, the natural migration of the herring. Well, guess what we're doing now? We're digging up all those cranberry bogs and we're cutting down all the trees and we're putting that water back in Miss Thatcher's pond. And they did a study, or Woods Hole did a study on the inundation of what's going to happen when we get Bass River flowing like that again. And so I said to the director, so what did the study say? He goes, uh, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the people are not going to be happy that live on the edge of Bass River. Nobody's ever happy. Uh, excuse me, some people are. But there are rights of way, and I became the president of my beach association in South Ennis to try and preserve the rights of way for all the residents to be able to go down and access the water. So this family had the gall to move into our neighborhood, buy the most expensive house in the whole neighborhood, and then hire an engineering firm, the same one that's actually doing Weymouth, and go to the Conservation Commission and ask to put stairs from their house down to the pond. Through the history of my life, I grew up there. Dad was one of the first people to build the house down there. We've always just built stairs down the pond. Everybody's done it. Everybody that's ever lived there has done it. But this family, New Yorkers, thought, well, why don't we be responsible? We've got the money. They have spent like $15,000 of their own money. We spent like $20. And they hired a team to give them and then went to Conservation Commission, all of a sudden, all my neighbors who I'd never heard from are, no, they can't have stairs. I'm like, oh, what do you mean they can't have stairs? It's going to cause erosion. Oh, they're going to be dangerous. They're going to be the safest, most well-engineered stairs we've ever had in our neighborhood. It's amazing how vocal opposition is. If you get a room in here, and I bring up a subject that's controversial, the 50 people that agree with me are not going to say much, but the two people that don't agree with me are going to be like, boom, boom, boom. 
So all of a sudden, neighbors I had never even met are coming out of the woodworks. No, they can't have stairs. They've never even paid their $75 dues. We have dues of $75 just to insure that property, the, the commons area between our houses and the water. So, woe is me, right? Sign up to do these things. You want to try and help your neighbors. I tried to, trying to save our access to the beaches, but it's always the new people. When you, when you only have one or two neighbors, don't you, you know them really well, and you can walk in their house and borrow some flour or something. But when you get 50 neighbors, all of a sudden, you don't even really know them that much. Maybe the guy next door or something. And that's one of the reasons I love the weather, is because when it snows, we all go out to the end of our driveways and shovel, and we get to meet, oh, Joe, when did you move here? On 1998? <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> over. And so I actually shovel my sidewalk four houses in both directions. And I know all my neighbors, and it's really cool in Weymouth. I don't have a fence on either side of that yard that I showed you. No fence, no fence. And we can hit golf balls between our yards and stuff. That's awesome, and I'm trying to keep it like that on Cape Cod, but the, the whole rights of way in the ocean and the climate change, it's really, and, and, and people wanting to go to the ocean, you'd think with climate change, people would start going away, but no. I mean, People will buy a house just 20 feet from the ocean, and sadly, on Cape Cod, because there are laws that you cannot build hard armaments, houses have to be pulled. I don't know if you've been following, uh, houses will be destroyed, or, or you know, they have to be, you have to pay to demolish your house, get it out of the way, so it doesn't fall in the ocean. And on Nantucket, the citizens of Nantucket, Baxter Road, very wealthy citizens, probably some of them in here, uh, do any of you have a beach house on Baxter Road? <laughs> uh, Hostetter, you know that name? Uh, they spent their own money to build geotubes. And what they did is ge geotube is a sausage, like big as this corner of the room. A sausage of sand, compacted. And they put them at the base of the bluff at Baxter Road in Nantucket. And six years ago, I covered it as a journalist then. And I met both sides. And they funded it themselves, and even though half the town didn't want it, so they got it th through the state, allowed it to happen. And, but there was a rule that they had to put 30,000 yards of fill over the geotube every spring. Mm -hmm. So the opposition said, well, we're going to make it into a donut. We're just going to take Nantucket, and we're going to dig out the middle and try and put it on the edges to save <laughs> this town, this road, Sankari. Yeah. And, uh, they didn't do it. They didn't do the 30,000 yards. They just ignored it. Dumb, 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 dumb. And so now they've just admitted defeat. They're paying at their own expense to remove the geo tube, which is going to result in their houses falling into the ocean. So no matter how screwed up your neighborhood is, <laughs> there's another one. So I'm more involved with most, a lot of this stuff than I wish I was, but I put myself there. I'm trying to save Blue Hill Observatory. We're having a grand opening at the Blue Hill Observatory. It's called the Mish Michael Center for Scientific Discovery. We've modified it, we've had the building rebuilt, and we're having a three-day celebration on May 18th, 19th, and 20th. And on the morning of the 20th, it's a Saturday, we're having the Southern New England Weather Conference. You get to meet all the meteorologists. So look for a flyer in your mailbox. <laughs> Make the checks out to Blue Hill Observatory in honor of Mish Michaels, who sadly we lost a year ago to mental illness. Mish decided that, Mish decided that her family would be better off without her. Incredible, horrifying. Everyone, we were all just shocked. And there were signs, and there were people in the house Four people. She snuck out the window. Wow. So those four people, they gotta live with that now. Wow. We all have to live with the loss. So she was such an inspiration for so many of us. <clears throat> when I left WMUR in New Hampshire, she took my spot and I knew she was gonna fly by me and the next thing I know, she's at Channel 7 and the Weather Channel and then every station in yeah. Boston was competing to get Mish. And she goes, so she <clears throat> said, uh, I would only go to five if they took Harvey Leonard, because she loved Harvey Leonard so much. So that's how Harvey Leonard got to Channel 5. Then I don't know why Mish did not. Um, 
Mish chose to um, retire from meteorology. <coughs> she told me she refused to be sexified. Huh. Exact direct quote. Uh -huh. And she goes, Tim, I wish I did what you did in my 30s. I'm like, what's that? You had fun. <laughs> I was working hard on my career. I'm like, huh, can you tell my wife that? <laughs> uh, it's always a balance. It's a really tough balance. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, Blue Hills Earth Observatory is going to put her name in perpetuity and it's dedicated to her. And so the, the grand opening, we're going to have a ribbon cutting, and it's May 18th. I'm trying to get it to change it to something warmer, but <laughs> we almost had Jim Cantori. Jim and Mish were so tight. Um, we're all friends. And Jim was like, yeah, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. And he goes, calls me a week later. Uh, well, my sister's son is graduating, so I can't make it. Oh my God, the people at Blue Hill are like so deflated. Because it takes somebody like that yeah. to draw people. I'll put my name on it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was at Cohasset, they really liked it. <laughs> no, but everyone knows that I'll get up and talk, so it's a given. I love to talk, and I'm so grateful. Look at up. A lot of people are still awake. <laughs> it's been 87 minutes. <laughs> Do we look tired today? I'm, I'll be taking a nap in an hour. <laughs> I started my day at uh, Vermont. My wife's like, are we going back to Stowe after that? I'm like, what? I don't want to go. <laughs> All right, my pleasure. <laughs>